Hey, Derek, welcome to the show. How are you? Really? Yeah, I guess uh, probably you spent this month learning a lot from your podcast, right? It's now over 400 episodes or something, right? Yeah, I've been really dialed in on the solo episodes uh, on my, my show, but uh, you reached out and uh, we're doing a swap. So this works great. And uh, yeah, excited to share some yeah. new stuff. <clears throat> Obviously, I learned about your background and things that you do. And I thought it's really, really interesting for us to chat. Also, it uh, will help a lot with our audiences. So Derek, why don't you start with a quick intro about yourself and your background and what do you do these days? Yeah, my name is Derek Vidal. I've been doing online entrepreneurship for six years, but uh, entrepreneurship for about 11 or 12. I, I've been uh, all 100% commission-based for that long, self-employed. And um, yeah, of course, it's got its ups and downs, but uh, things have been going well recently. I've done a lot of different online businesses, e-commerce, now SaaS, uh, digital education courses, consulting, agency work. I've dabbled in basically everything. And uh, yeah, th lately I've found uh, a good stride coming from my YouTube. So I um, do mostly Facebook ads, consulting and agency work, and then getting into mm -hmm. AI chatbots as well. So this all happens under my company, Social Bamboo. I do have some other businesses too, like in the e-commerce space, but um, yeah, I definitely keep busy and uh, ha have gone through a lot of failures, but I've also found a lot of things that have worked too. So it's been, uh, yeah, yeah, I absolutely love it. So what inspired you to be an entrepreneur? I mean, you've been doing this for, for quite a while, obviously so many ups and downs. So what's keeping you awake and, and energetic about being an entrepreneur? Yeah. So my first experience was in college. I got a sales job in my junior year of college. And I ended up doing that sales job for seven and a half years because my goal was to just do it for a, a couple of years be, uh, before I graduated and then use that experience to go get a job. And I hit the job market and I just realized like I can make more in sales as it is. Like, so I don't even need this degree, nor do I use that degree for anything. Um, uh, or even in you know, the knowledge, I don't think it's applicable to entrepreneurship. Um, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so I, I just kind of knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur after I was self-employed long enough for that company because it really was work as much as you want or as or as little as you want. You generated your own referrals, and you if you don't want to sell anything, that's fine. You just don't get paid. It's all commission. And uh, I just learned the entrepreneurial mindsets from that. And then after seven and a half years, I found that it was time to to start something new and I knew online was you know the the place to go so I started messing around online nice and how did you learn all the online stuff right social media online marketing affiliates I bought a lot of courses but I would say that most learning still takes place when you just do it and uh, you figure it out as you go uh, so I started with an e-commerce company in the aquarium space and we did uh, a lot of amazon fba and we did facebook ads and we did uh, organic instagram growth and actually grew that page to fifty thousand followers uh just from education wow. from youtube and um you know just taking action and, and adjusting and um and then that's when i started the podcast i was like well, well I, it was funny because i was driving around with my sales job that i was like transitioning out of and I was like, there's no Instagram podcast. So a few hours later, I started one. And yeah. I was just like, just put out like how to set up your bio, how to post a story, like uh, just the most basic episodes ever. And I <laughs> called it Instagram Marketing Secrets. And because I called it that, uh, within a couple of weeks, it was like number one if you typed in Instagram because the space wasn't owned yet. And it was just kind of crazy. So that's how what started that whole thing. And then I closed that e-commerce company. And, you know, it's a bit, it's, it's been a lot at this point, um, but I think you just kind of know, uh, I, I, to answer your question, how do, why did I get into entrepreneurship? I think people get into it more because they would hate to work a traditional job more than they would love to work in entrepreneurship. Like everyone would love to own a business, but you have to hate 
a traditional job and <laughs> to, yeah. to, to be broke long enough to, to figure it out. <laughs> so yes, and then um, you figure out you need to be the, the manager, the accountants, the cleaning, yeah. you know, uh, person, you, need to, you have to do everything right on your own and no one else can do that for you. So that's a burden that most people are, have some difficulties taking, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Being every job is, is the hardest part of it. It's also the yeah. most fun part of it too. So you, you have the Facebook ads expertise and you've been doing this for quite a while and then you're on the podcast. So it's like yeah, a very good mix of like, let's say inbound, uh, let's say earned media versus owned media. So, I mean, inbound and outbound, those needs to live together in a very balanced way, a balanced way, right? So when you work with companies today, tell us more about the Facebook ad services that you provide and what are the processes you put in place to make it a successful type of business? Yeah, so this business model is really simple. It's basically YouTube videos on how to run Facebook ads and all of these different things. And, and really, once I focused on YouTube of just Facebook ads, Facebook ads, Facebook ads, that's when it finally started working. So I do mm -hmm. want to say that because I actually posted all this random stuff on YouTube for a long time. I actually used to dual purpose my podcast on there. But as I was telling you before the call, now it's completely separate info because the podcast is whatever I want to talk about that week. And then YouTube, it doesn't work like that. I can't just talk about entrepreneur mindset and then Instagram reels tips and then Facebook ads. Like, it's just like when I started doing Facebook ads, Facebook ads, mm -hmm. Facebook ads, like one, at least one video a week is like what it averages out to. Um, then I started getting all the right calls and basically those just lead to a, a free call funnel. And then I sell either done with you or, or done for you services. And I think this is also a really key thing. If you want to get into selling any kind of coaching, if you can offer done with you and done for you, then it makes it. So you always have like a high ticket thing that you can sell people who don't have time for you. And then you also have this, uh, more affordable thing that people that do have the time and can learn it. It really is the way to like make sure you can close the most of the people that you talk mm -hmm. to, because you're always going to talk to some people who want to learn it themselves versus want you to do it um, whenever you sell any kind of service. So if you can offer both, it helps a lot. And then, um, yeah, Facebook ads, I've been doing, you know, a lot of just like in, in general business consulting too is what it ends up being because I've offered free calls from my podcast for so long. I've done so mm -hmm. many of the calls. But that's how I got really sharp at it. And that's how you just go through enough experiences and you talk to enough people and then you find out what's working for them and what, you know, what businesses never work and, and why that is. And then all of that experience, um, yeah, just led me to, to really figure out Facebook ads was, you know, something that basically every business tries to utilize at some point. Yes. I mean, there is in terms of Facebook ads, like any ad, other ads platform, it seems that brands or companies, they have so much focus on clicking the right buttons, right, on the platform and the right check boxes. How, how do you see the process? I mean, there is a lot of foundation that needs to have in place. Companies need to understand their, their consumers and understand the, the, the sentiment of the products and overall as a brand. I mean, there are like, I'm, I'm talking about the more of the strategy level, you know, when you start working with a company, obviously just technical work of how to place the ads. Obviously there is a creative side of things. So tell us more about what do you think, what do you see as a best practice for this type of processes? Yeah, we're in the best year to run Facebook ads ever. And uh, I would say that it's been declining for years in a lot of ways. And then this year I call it like really the great revival because of a few factors. One, a lot of the technical went away. So no longer should you do any kind of like all this ad set testing. You, you It used to be like, oh, I'm running entrepreneur ads. All right, I'm going to run an, to the Tony Robbins audience, the Grant Cardone audience, the Gary Vaynerchuk audience, people interested in entrepreneurship, people interested in business, people okay. interested in marketing. And you'd have to spend all of this money to test all of these different ad sets. And a lot of companies don't even have an interest that lines up with what they're selling. So like I have a, a new customer right now that's an immigration lawyer. Like there's not a button that you can be like interested in immigration law, like that that interest didn't even exist. So a lot of companies couldn't even run ads because they didn't even have a targetable interest. The best targeting in about 75, probably now 85% of cases, no matter what, I keep testing it just to make sure, is just set nothing, set, put nothing at all. Your targeting is put nothing. You do the age and you do the gender and you do location and that's it. You don't put any interests. You don't do a lookalike audience. You don't do anything. You put nothing there. 
and that works almost every time. Even I just talked to a client yesterday who sells pickleball paddles. The, the interest pickleball exists. If you run ads to pickleball versus nothing there, the ads with nothing kills the ad with interest targeting pickleball. Wow. If I run ads for wedding photographers, when I, I can either put in the couples engaged, I can put that relationship status engaged. That should work. That should work the best, right? Me putting nothing there works way better. So it knows everything about everyone and you don't need to tell it anything now. And it works way better to not limit wow. it at all. So all of the targeting happens in the caption now. So now all you need to do is you write an ad that says, hey, audience name, do you have this problem? Don't even do any other intro. Don't even do any other first sentence. This is all that works. Don't, don't, don't go crazy. Don't do your you know, fancy lingo. You're trying to write the most simple caption ever. And you're just going to say, hey, audience name, do you have this problem? And it's going to, Facebook's going to read what you just wrote there. And then that's the targeting now. So mm -hmm. if you sell, like these people sell anime branded pickleball paddles. If you say, hey, do you love anime and you love pickleball? Like <laughs> it'll be like, we got you. We got you. We know who to show this to. So that's why it's like the golden age is like the, no longer is there any targeting. The targeting is just write the caption, which also makes the caption a lot more obvious what you should write. So it takes away a lot of the guess factor there. But the fact that you just don't have to test 10 different ad sets before you find out the three winning ones saves you like one to $2,000 on testing that used right. to have to happen before. Now it's just open targeting. You already know, like this is the one that's gonna work. And you can try a lookalike of purchasers. Like I've got a company I'm running ads for. They have like 14,000 purchases on a certain product. I make a lookalike audience of that was 14,000 purchasers and it doesn't work as well as setting nothing. So uh, like, I really mean like, it's probably well over 85% and growing of like how often the open targeting is going to win. So that's why, like, if you, like I, you know, mosquito control is a, a new client of mine. Like you can just say, Hey, Austin, Texas, do you want, you need mosquito control? But here's why it's harder is that if you can't just spit it out and just tell people what you sell and what the price is and it doesn't sell, then there's not much else you can do. So we used to be in this phase of roundabout marketing, as I like to call it, where it was like, mm -hmm. watch my one hour webinar, put in your email, watch the one hour webinar, get emails from me all week and with a countdown timer. And then that will close you on my course with like multiple upsells on the back end of that course. And now the ad that works really well in almost every industry and basically what I always test with is just a blank square, like just a black square with white text. And you're just going to say like, hey, um, hey, wedding photographers, I will get you four to eight new wedding leads a month using Facebook ads for $7.50 a month. And you just like run that ad because no <laughs> one needs the, the price disguised anymore is why it's also so nice. Like there's no like watch this webinar, then I'm going to tell you why it's worth $8,700, but today <laughs> only with this fake countdown timer, you know, you can get it for 997. Like the, the average 13 year old knows it's BS now. Yeah. So <laughs> there's, you don't need to do anything apart from just tell people what you sell and how much it costs. And if that doesn't work, you need to switch companies. But if that works, then there you go. That's your marketing. You're, you just tell people wow. what it is and what it costs. Interesting. So open targeting is winning. And how do you explain that it is because of the, the they've changed the algorithm? probably using more AI on the backend side. Well, what's that change? It's probably more AI reading the mm -hmm. caption and, uh, and doing who knows what, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah. it's almost scary that it works better than, you know, some of those examples I gave you, like engaged couples should work the best. If you're a wedding photographer trying to sell to engaged couples, like how does that one, that, that was the one that I was like, okay, this one's got to work better. Than open targeting but after it didn't it's just like it knows who who is interested in what and i don't know if it's plugged into your alexa or how it's getting the info but um but thank god you're the advertiser so you love it yeah and you said this is the best year for facebook ads i mean i hear a lot of companies that are complaining i mean cpcs are going so so high and very difficult to compete and you know find to acquire it's because they're not doing open targeting 
Yeah, <laughs> I guess this is a secret sauce, right? If they already have had success in the past and it stopped working, it's most likely because they're not doing open targeting or, exactly. their, um, or their captions are too long or they're going to be the main okay. two things. So they just keep doing whatever they did two years ago, I guess, right? So then the DSS is expecting it to work. Do a similar thing, go back to open targeting, and then make sure you're not doing any kind of roundabout marketing where there's multiple steps that happen before a sale happens. Like e even like consulting offers, like I can just say, um, you know, learn how to run Facebook ads on weekly Zoom calls, mm -hmm. um, you know, and seven fifty a month. And like, that's like my offer, like that's what I sell. So like, right. I can just say that and then get leads from that. And then when someone signs up for that lead form, they're already signed up. So a lot of times too, like a few years ago, you had to do this phone call close where you'd have to be like, what do you want in life? You want a family and you want to travel? Awesome. Sounds like having a great business would help with that. Do you want it? Like my program is normally 8,000. If you buy it on this call, it's seven, it's <laughs> 5,000. Hmm. Um, you know, yeah. it's like a lot of like, it was uh, very, uh, like salesy salesy like uh, selling you know it was like really emotionally tying in the customer and doing a huge discount if they bought on the call and now yeah. i don't even have like discounts um because people also know the free call it is to buy services so the world mm -hmm. is just very um immune to any kind of roundabout marketing and they just get it and they love when you are transparent they just love transparency and it's just so much easier to set up ads that go like add to like free call than this, mm -hmm. you know, extra process. And this is with e-commerce too. Um, I put the price of products in the ads too, because I don't want you to click the ad unless you also agree with the price in a way, because otherwise the algorithm is going to start thinking, oh, well, this person clicked on the ad. They must be a good interested customer. Let's show them the ad more. I'm like that, that. It is a good indicator. However, if they clicked already knowing that it's $38, then I know they're really targeted. Um, yes. And the, so it's just, it, it's better to to put more in the ad now. Yeah, obviously. And they can figure out if, if, if there is a checkout or there is a, there is a transaction after the click in the ad, then probably there is a high, uh, high, intent, high intent here. Facebook can recognize that there is a real value here and the, the probability for a, for a checkout or for a purchase is high after clicking this ad. So probably this mm -hmm. is a very, very important factor for them. And uh, wow, interesting. Really, really interesting. So what I hear you say is just, I hear just it's just be straight to the point, specific, simple, cre creative, nothing fancy. Just deliver the message quickly and this is what's working today, right? Mm -hmm. and, and open targeting. Nice. Yep. So what, what about the other things that you do on the AI chatbot side of the business? Yeah. So uh, I was working with a company. It's a supplement company. They sell like over a hundred supplements and they get questions all day. They just can't stay off the phone because people uh, just, they, they say, Hey, these are all the random health ailments I have and which one should I take and what frequency and can I take it with this other medication and just so many questions. And, um, we built an AI chatbot company for, uh, or ch not AI. Well, we did build an AI chatbot co company, but we built an AI chatbot for her, um, to test it out. And this is like one of my Facebook ads clients. And uh, we just wanted to really reduce the amount of customer service they were have to doing uh, have to be doing before they could get a sale. And I trained the bot. Um, it's a bot made in a, a software called Go High Level, and trains the bot off the website. You go through like a, hundreds of conversations with it, and make sure that it does the right responses. And after a while, it just answers customers correctly. I'd say like well over ninety five percent of the time. And you can still tweak it from there. I, every once in a while, I just go in and I just monitor all the conversations the bot is having. And it has uh, about 12 to 20 different conversations a day. So it was really quick for me to figure out if this would work. And this bot is basically the most complex an AI bot would get on a website. It's like a supplement company with all these different things. And people are asking health questions. But it's mm -hmm. powered by ChatGPT. And it is trained that, hey, if they get ever really technical just refer them to a healthcare provider, right? So it's got that level where it's like, don't try to answer at this point <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, or tell them to call into the office. Um, 
but uh, but it is just trained by the entire internet already. So it answers really, really well. And I started um, applying that to my own business. So you can go to socialbamboo.com and talk to my AI assistant, Brooke. And uh, she just will, she'll get you on a call. She's just going to get you on a call. <laughs> so, um, but it's really solid just seeing the amount of people um, check these out. So I imagine this next phase of marketing being a lot of sales pages or landing pages that um, you know, do the free guide or sell you a course or whatever will just be the checkout box and then an AI chat bot and nothing else on there. Like you want testimonials, ask the chat bot, she'll send you all the testimonials or mm-hmm. like, whatever you want is probably just going to be really refined to um, that. So the customers just have a conversation with the bot, which is trained to answer people exactly how you want them to. So it's really cool. And they're not very hard to build because there's no coding in- involved at all. The way that you train chatbots is the same language that you would train a person you just say hey if they ask this just tell them this all right like you could just use normal everyday language to train your chatbot so anytime it's answering questions wrong you just go in you're like thumbs down say this next time thumbs up good job thumbs up good job thumbs down say this next time is like what the ongoing training looks like so uh yeah i started pro bots and um, we can build bots for companies that want nothing to do with this. Just like I was talking about before, the done for you and the done with you. Or for people that want to do it themselves, we get you the software for 97 bucks. You get unlimited lifetime training too. So you get courses that show you how to do this. And then if you ever have a question, you can pop on a 15 minute call with me or someone on my team to diagnose it with you, you know, mm-hmm. for the duration of you having the software. So you can learn how to do this completely yourself. And it's only 97 a month for everything that you need. Amazing. It, it's really amazing to see how fast these chatbots are learning. Just uh, push, you know, content over there, articles, whatever information you have, and they quickly start delivering results. They're not bad even in the, in the first go, but then you need to provide additional feedback and any day that passes by is just becoming really amazing in terms of performance. So I experienced this also in the, on, on our platform, on the Vimy platform. And in terms of chatbot, it's really like customer support or some of the sales aspects of things. It's really impressive. Yeah, so I would love to have the the information on uh, on the on the chatbot and the show notes, and maybe you can provide some incentive for for our listeners also to uh, uh, to, to purchase that. So that's a really amazing thing. So I want to go back because you create a lot of content, right? You have the podcast, you also on YouTube. So I, I'd love to learn from you and probably give some tips for like other leaders out there because content is like really really important right it's what differentiates everything and make, makes all of you know your marketing efforts much more authentic and resonates with people how tell us about the importance of content creation and how you can encourage other leaders out there to start creating content on their own because everyone maybe people like to write to read to write sorry maybe people like to create content on audio or video everyone has a fit for something right but i think have, i'm trying to encourage more of our listeners to start creating content on any platform. So let's talk about that topic for, for a few minutes. Yeah, so um, creating content specifically in what way? No, I mean, just uh, if you can share, I mean, you create a lot of content, obviously, both on YouTube and on the podcast, mm-hmm. right? So what, what drives you to create content, why, why it's important, and how others can get started with content creation, you know, in 2024? Yeah, it really is such a an answer with a lot of gray space in 2024. Should you create content? Mm-hmm. I don't really post on Instagram anymore. It doesn't really do that much. Uh, and that's a lot of companies. Okay, so like for e-commerce, let me tell you a really interesting tip that I've arrived at recently right. is like what really is happening here. There are products that are innately viral and you should create tons of content. I have a customer right now that sells these things that you put on your window and it makes a rainbow appear in your house. And she can film that and go viral and sell a ton. She should post content all the time on Instagram and TikTok. You should do whatever works, okay? Don't do this like blanket statement. Well, I heard posting on Instagram is important. I've been doing it for three years and I've never got a sale, but it's important, right? If you haven't got results, stop. You should not be posting there. I get all of my clients from YouTube. I only keep up the podcast because I have so many subscribers 
from 2018, 2019 that still listen to the show that I don't want to let them down and it's fun. I don't get any calls from there anymore. I get three calls maybe this year compared to my like 150 plus that have come from YouTube this year. And right. that used to be the other way around. It used to be none from YouTube and podcasts would book me like multiple calls per week. And it's just not where they come from anymore. So I used to do two episodes a week. Now I went down to one episode a week. It would make sense for me to stop. I don't want to. I'm not at episode 500 yet. I still enjoy it. It doesn't take me that long. Like I was telling you before the call, like I don't do a big production anymore. And part of it's mm -hmm. for that reason. I got rid of the big production because I'm like, this isn't even that worth it to me in a lot of ways, like just based off the data um, that I'm getting, you know, so I, my content creation game is based off of my data and your content creation game should be based off of your data. Not because someone told you they, they got success because you got to realize that like every company is so different. And like in that situation, like e-commerce, e like she goes innately viral just posting her product. Like this organic content should be a humongous part of her um, yeah. strategy. It, you know, influencer marketing should be a humongous part of her strategy. All of that is really important. Um, for other companies, uh, like the pickleball paddles, like they just have to run ads that show their pickleball paddle and people buy it. And when they post that same thing, it doesn't get any likes. When they do it as an ad, it gets a lot of sales. When they post it as a organic content, it gets no likes no views because it's not viral content. So you, you got to like realize like, what is your company like, and how has your content game been working? Everyone needs to exist at the minimum uh, on every platform too. If they try to find you on any platform, you should have at least it set up and the base amount of like posts in your bio, like set up everywhere mm -hmm. on every yeah. LinkedIn, Pinterest, all of that. You should, you should at least exist on, um, I think is a, a great social media strategy to say like, to do this minimum. Um, but then from there, you know, really base it on, um, I think it, it, I would say if, like, what question should you ask yourself to figure out where you should go is where is the low hanging fruit in my industry? Because really marketing that is based around how do I sell to people who are already looking to buy what I'm selling is really where you find a lot of success and really where you see, oh, marketing isn't doing that much except for showing up at the right time at the right place. So yeah. if I know that, hey, someone that types in on YouTube how to run Facebook ads and then watches my 10 minute video, that's a good client who's ready to learn Facebook ads that day. If I post on Instagram, here's how to run Facebook ads. You're just scrolling on Instagram. You're not looking to invest in a coaching program that day. So sure. that's not where the majority of my efforts should be going. Um, you're trying to show up at the time and place that this person is ready to buy you. And like, that's where all of your marketing efforts should be around because everything else is just, um, you know, it's putting in a lot of time for the hope that eventually it will pay off. But I, I kind of say now, just because we're in this phase of marketing where you can kind of just spit it out that if you're not getting results there after like six months to a year, you're, you're probably not going to see them come eventually. So, yes. you know, be, yes, it makes a lot of sense. yes. So when did you start on YouTube? Five years ago, technically, three years ago, more seriously. Yeah. And how do you attribute uh, leads to your to the YouTube activities? I ask at the beginning of every call. I would like to make this word, uh, I, you know, because I was like, dang, I think the podcast has only done like three calls. I was like, I would love an actual stat, though. <laughs> it's like that I would be, you know, tagging people that come into my system from YouTube videos differently. Um, but, uh, I, I ask at the beginning of every call, Hey, did you come from my podcast or YouTube? And then they, they tell me YouTube video earlier this morning. And that's the other thing is from YouTube. They're like, I watched your video today and I booked a call today. When they come from the podcast, they say, I've been listening to you for years. I figured <laughs> I should finally book that call because on podcast, they find me they, by typing in marketing. Oh, here's a marketing podcast on YouTube. They find me because they typed in how to run Facebook ads. And then they found my video on how to run Facebook ads. So just the intent of someone online is like how you find like this ready to buy traffic. Yeah. And how do you manage all the production and the post-production in YouTube? It needs to be obviously very good quality these days, right? Uh, you, people are immune to fancy video editing. So, uh, but they are also immune to people that don't know their stuff. So if you, <laughs> how do you be good on YouTube and it, 
any content platform is to actually be really freaking good at what you do. Uh, mm -hmm. More so than like any video trick, like tricks that you can do, like just actually being an expert in your industry is bar none, like the best thing that you can yes. do to have content success anywhere. So I do a pretty simple, I do screen recordings and then I film myself. So you want to also find what kind of content can I make where it really doesn't take that much time because it has nothing to do with laziness. It just comes down to like, there's only so many hours in the day. And if you're going to do this for years, you know, you don't want to make it where every time you make a YouTube video, it costs six hours versus like one. Right. Yeah. So um, then you can just put it, come out with six videos. Right. You could, it, it has nothing to do with like being lazy. Uh, but I, I just have the camera here. I turn that on and then I screen record and then I do it and then I get that video and then I um, chop it up to make it quicker. And then I add just effects at the, in the first 30 seconds. So like the first 30 seconds is like where really where you need to retain people. Yes. So that's where I might do like a punch in or like my name or like some text or maybe even a sound um, and like a transition in. And then I basically just go to like the screen recording and I do like click by click tutorials that move quickly. But they came to the video to learn this thing and it's a quick it's a click by click tutorial that's moving as quick as it can. So like it's all they really wanted. Um, and I don't do that much video editing. So I can make my own videos, um, with that editing style. If I do a video though, where I just talk to the camera for 20 minutes, I do send that to a video editor and I say, sure. Hey, like I, there's nothing going because the screen recording isn't happening. There's not enough going on in that situation. Yeah. So I do send it to, for him to like put in B roll footage and stuff when I do those type, types of videos. Yeah. So in terms of the screen recording, you're just sharing your uh, Facebook campaign or specific things yeah. you want to do, right? Clear. Yeah, Clear. I'll just be like this button right here. This is good to press because of this and this button, you know. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> it's way more clear. It, it's just better content for explaining to do a screen recording in this case anyways. Yeah. So Derek, after more than 400 episodes and also five years on YouTube, I'm, I'm really interested in some of your uh, tips for uh, other entrepreneurs out there, right? You learned a lot, obviously, on so many aspects of the business. What are some of the highlights that you can share with us with fellow entrepreneurs out there? I'm going to put it into numbers where over the last six years, to be completely transparent, and I am, I just, so last month was my biggest month ever. And then this month is looking to be my second biggest month ever. And this came out of nowhere. And it, I'm really glad to have this insight because otherwise it is weird when you do podcast episodes where you're like, man, I just have like a really low month because it, it really does happen where your sales can be all over the place because you'll even just be like, you know what? Screw this business. I'm starting another is what entrepreneurship can look like. When you start an entrepreneurship, you really will never want to go back to a traditional job. So for that reason, like if, if you find any success and you like it, you probably won't want to go back to a traditional job. There's very few businesses that you'll do for more than 10 years. Therefore, you're going to be making new businesses just as other people transition jobs, which means that some of those businesses demand a lot of capital. So uh, and some of them don't, uh, but some of them do require a lot of investment from you uh, or mm -hmm. reinvesting that money back into the company. So your income is going to be all over the place. So over the last six years, I've made probably between like $500 and like $15,000 a month. And it's just all over the place. And um, this is like every entrepreneur has this level of fluctuation. It just might be around much higher numbers or, or it could be way, way lower numbers too if they're going into massive debt. So yeah. um, you, you, you can't just be about like, I wanna make all this money. Like it can totally happen and it's really awesome when you get there. You won't even appreciate it if you'd never had like those months where you like make nothing and like nothing works or you just reinvest yeah. every dollar you make. Like if, if the first business idea you came out with worked, like you would never even like truly appreciate entrepreneurship or you get this really um, just unclear uh, conception of like what it actually is. Like um, it's like someone who uh, is like 18 years old and hits a crypto bull run and becomes a millionaire at 18. Like they have, uh, you know, no proper perception of how to actually make money because <laughs> they're like, money's easy to make. Like that was so easy. <laughs> and, and like, then the, the next couple opportunities that like are going to go terrible for them and it's going to like, you know, really humble them. So it's, it's kind of good that it's not easy. It really is. So like, just, um, you know, if, if you love it, then just 
really stick with it and you'll eventually figure something out, but work as quick as you can too. So you, you are trying to work smart and hard and uh, you're just trying to really complete as many tasks as you can in a day and, uh, and have fun doing it. So if you don't have that part, it's going to be really difficult to, um, you know, ever keep up with it. I think if you're curious about, should I start a business? I think 100% you should do it and you'll know within six months if it's something that you want to keep doing. Because if you still love it, even though you're not making a lot of money, then then awesome. You'll stick with it as long as you have to, because you already love what you're doing. If you hate, like, oh, I hate learning Facebook ads. I hate going on YouTube to teach myself all these things. Then, yeah, you'll you'll naturally know. But I think a lot of people that even like start a business and then realize it's not for them are glad that they did because they did, then they don't have to just live with this regret of what if I started that business. And it, it's funny because there's a bunch of people who just like, I, I know them personally, they're in there later in life. And they're like, man, if only I started that business, but I know their character well enough that I'm like, you wouldn't have liked it. <laughs> so like, if only you would have started it. So you could just show yourself that you wouldn't have liked it rather than just have this regret of what if I started it? And I'm like, trust me, you, you wouldn't have liked it. <laughs> Perfect, Derek. So how can people find you? Yeah. So, uh, on Instagram, I'm just at Derek Fidel. And then on YouTube, I'm Derek Fidel as well. And you can just check out my Instagram bio link for whatever I've got going on at the time. Amazing. Derek, anything else you want to add? That will do it. Check out, uh, your episode on my show, social media entrepreneurs to come out soon. Yes. Amazing. So thank you so much, Derek. It was a pleasure hosting you. It was super interesting. Absolutely.